Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. If y'all stand, we're going to do something a little different this morning. We've got several people out sick. And so we're going to just go back a little bit. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, I want to see you, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up. Glory, pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, Lord, pour out your power and love, as we sing holy, holy. Good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Temple this morning. Thank you, members, for being in your place. Uh, if you're visiting with us, you've been visiting with us a while, we appreciate you continuing to come and visit with us because you'll learn a little bit more about us each time that you come. If you're a first-time visitor with us, we appreciate you being here and choosing this church. Uh, what I would like to ask if you're a first-time visitor is that if you got this card, we'd really like for you to complete it and put it in an offering plate or hand it to one of the guys in the green jackets. We just want to know that you came and visited with us today. Uh, we promise not to bug you, but we do love you, and we want to find out a little bit about you if we can. Uh, how many of you guys love Jesus? Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let's pray, and we'll bless our offering this morning. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. We just thank you, dear Lord God, for all the blessings you pour out on us. We pray, Father, that we'll do better, that you'll be more pleased with the things that we do each and every day. I pray, Father, that you help us to be a better church, uh, better in our community, better to our families, better to our friends. Help us, dear Lord God, to represent you well. We love you, Father. We thank you for bringing us into your house this morning, and we'll give you all the praise, honor, and glory for all that you do. We ask, Father, that you also bless this offering, those that give, those that may not be able to. It'll be for your work, for your kingdom. And we just give you all the praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, this morning we want to do something, uh, uh, we're going to do something a little different. And uh, we had a member come to me and uh, share his experience in another church. And um, you guys know my heart. I, I think that we've seen prayer do some pretty amazing things in our church. And um, I, I, I love the idea. And the idea was to have a moment that we can just stop and kind of pray. Uh, we sang a couple of songs, worship songs to the Lord. And, um, you know, the idea of preparing our hearts to hear the Word of God. And um, so whether you want to um, come down this altar, he's going to play through a, a, a verse of the song that we're going to sing. And um, you can come down this altar prayer. You can pray there in your seat. Um, but we just want to have a time where we get our hearts ready for the Lord. So um, if you'll stand with us, then uh, I'll lead us in prayer now. And, and like I said, as he plays, you can feel free to come down the altar. Um, you can pray there in your seat. You can kneel at your seat if you'd like. But um, just ask God to prepare our hearts for the word of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Lord, we uh, are so unworthy of, of the blessings you give us in our life. Lord, as we just heard that choir special, we could sing of your love uh, forever, Lord. There's, there's no limit to your love. God, we just thank you so much for what you've shown us in our lives, for what you've blessed us with. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for the blood that you've shed for the remission of our sins, God. We thank you for the resurrection. We thank you for just leading us and guiding us. Lord, even in our darkest times, Lord, we have a lot of people that are going through a lot of stuff right now, Lord. We have a lot of hurt and, and hardship that people are going through. And God, we still know you're present. God, we still know that you care and you love us. You show that in so many ways. But God, I pray now that you would just prepare hearts. Lord, as we have this moment of prayer, Lord, just help us to remove any sin. Help us to remove anything that may be hindering. Uh, what you want to tell us this morning in the message, what you have for us. And so we pray that you move now in Jesus' name, amen. If you just take a moment, you can come down this altar. You feel free to do so. If you keep your eyes closed, maybe your head's bowed, I want to encourage you to come down here. Just take this moment and say, God, speak to my heart. Prepare my heart to hear your word, to worship you. And you can pray there at your seat.
be seated. Praise God is right. He is worthy of our praise. 
Thank you again for being here. We got some guests here this morning. Thank you for being here and, and being, being our guest. Um, we uh, did a few things different here this morning. We had uh, our song leader was sick, and then other member of the praise team that uh, usually fills in for him was sick, and Brother Jim was kind of trying to do things musically, so we, we just stepped right in there and, and led it on. So praise God uh, that we're able to just worship him, like I said. If you got your Bibles, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you've been here for, uh, for the time that we've been going through it, you know that we are... Uh, just walking through uh, 1 Corinthians in, in, in our AM services. And um, last week we left off with Paul's rebuke uh, for the, the, the believers there uh, for suing other believers. And he kind of gave instructions concerning uh, dealing with offenses within the body and, and how uh, we are to take some steps in resolving issues, not just by saying, you know what, uh, this is a problem, I'm going to sue them. And we talked about how that, that's even the case in today's society with all these frivolous lawsuits going on, even with Christians. And uh, we talked a little bit about Judge Judy. You can watch Judge Judy for a little bit and see how ridiculous that, that it's got. But we had some principles that, that we laid down that serve as an example on what we're supposed to do, uh, what the Bible says we should do. And I want to review that real quick. We had these in your notes last week. And uh, again, if you weren't here, this is some of the things that we, we talked about. Number one, if... There's an issue with another believer. What are we supposed to do? Number one, we're supposed to make it right with that believer outside of court by going to them in a spirit of love and reconciliation. It's not supposed to, uh, you know, handle things the way the world does, uh, number one. But number two, if that isn't something that is, is accomplished, then use the wise men. And if there are ladies involved, wise women in the church in, in aiding uh, in, in the resolution of things biblically. The third thing was to take the highest road possible. And the highest road possible would be just absorb the wrong. Why not absorb the wrong? If somebody has wronged us, absorb the wrong. We talked about the Lord in that circumstance. How, how, much, how much wrong did he absorb on our account? And how much more should we then be willing to absorb the wrong that others do us? And again, we, 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 we fight, we bicker, we, we're willing to leave church even, willing to stop fellowship with believers over sometimes the smallest things in comparison to all the sins that Christ bore on our behalf and died for on our behalf. So why not just absorb the wrong? And again, we saw that in Scripture. That's what Paul said. But the fourth thing was this. We have to remember that inside the church, just because people go to church, doesn't mean that everybody in this room is a born-again believer. And there's some people, a lot of people in the world today, that profess Jesus Christ with their lips, with their mouths, but don't live that with their lives. It's not a, a true life change. So those people are, are often called nominal Christians or Christians in name only. And uh, we have to realize that that may be the case with that person treating us that way or taking advantage or hurting us or doing those things. And no matter what we may do inside of a courtroom, taking them to court or getting back at them, if they're lost, there's no more severe judgment that they'll face than what they'll face at the end of time when they stand before God at the, judge, at, at the great white throne judgment and face their eternal judgment in a lake of fire. And so we, we aren't to play that role and, and, and play that. And then this is the last thing that we talked about, that we have to remember that we too, before we were saved, were, it, were in that same exact lifestyle of sin. We were living a life that was submitted and under the, the, the control of sin. So those people are condemned already. We need to have a heart for one another as our neighbors, not just uh, the believers, but Jesus said, love them that are your, your enemies as well. So that, take, that takes a lot. But one thing that we looked at was in 1 Peter chapter 2, where Peter began to explain how Christ, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. And we talked in, in, in Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, how that, hey, what, what, what praise do you have if you, if, if, if you just love those who love you? And so it's, it's a, a high principle. But Paul used a, a, a bridge, if you will, in verse 12 of chapter, of chapter 6, that leads into this next se section of Scripture that we're going to talk about this morning. And I want to read verse 12 before we get into it. And, and he, he says this in verse 12, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. And all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Clearly, the Apostle Paul understood that he had the freedom to do certain things. But just because he had that freedom didn't give him license, and it didn't mean that it was the best thing to do. 
because he, he had the freedom to do it. It wasn't the most beneficial route to take. But in the last part of verse 12, he says that he is, by the freedom that he has in Christ, free to do or to partake in whatever he would choose to do. But he declares that he will not be brought under the power of anything. He declares that I am not going to allow anything to have dominion over me, nothing to have control over me, even if it's not sin, if it's something that is, is coveted, if it's, if it's a, if a possession that could be sin, becoming idolatry. Nothing that would control him above the Holy Spirit's control in his life. Many people live with that principle in their mind only. And it's a sad truth, but I'm free to do whatever I want to do. I'm born again. Christ has forgiven me. And, 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 and I'm not under the law. I don't have to go to church every time the doors are open. I don't have to read. I don't have to do that. I don't have to witness. That's not my gift. I don't have to do this. Many people think they have this freedom now in Christ to do what they want to do, but the case is this. Just because we have the freedom in Christ doesn't make it beneficial for the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean it's beneficial to do. And that's what Paul's saying. Hey, I have, I have the license to, to do. I'm free, but it doesn't mean that's what I should do. So with that in our minds, let's pray. And I want to look on in 1 Corinthians and, and, and see what God has for us this morning. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. God, I just thank you so much for the grace you pour out in our lives. Lord, thank you so much for the music this morning. You're so worthy of our praise. You have been so good to us. Lord, it, it, as that last song was just sung, the last couple songs, it is well. Lord, we know that this is not the end. This life we're experiencing right now is not the end. God, we, we've been given a hope that takes us beyond this life, and we praise you for that. God, I thank you that even in our dark times, even in our hard times, we can praise you, and you'll carry us through. But Lord, this morning we pray that you would move now in this message. God, that our hearts would be completely open. Lord, if there's someone here that's lost, they're still hanging on. They don't, they don't want to let go. They don't want to surrender their life to you. I pray this morning that you would speak to their hearts and, and, and help them realize that that life without you is just the road that's leading to destruction. They're not giving anything up when they surrender their life to you. They're gaining everything. I pray that you would reveal that to them this morning. For those of us who are born again, your children, Lord, I pray you'd speak to our hearts and that we would, we would guard, we'd protect what you've given us. Lord, that we'd be faithful to be obedient this morning as you, as you lead us in your word. And we pray and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 13, Paul goes on. And so he just said, I have the ability to do anything that I choose to do, but it's not beneficial. And so he goes on to verse 30, he says, meats for the belly and the belly for the meat, for meat. But God shall destroy both it and them. And then he says this, Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Someone might ask the question, well, how do these even compare? Meat for the belly and belly for the meat, and, and the body uh, is not for fornication, but it's for the Lord. How can you compare these, these two? Well, the truth is, is they don't compare. And that's why Paul is, is, is putting this in there as the Holy Spirit leads him, I believe. Because there's few points that we can gain from this, and by Paul writing this and putting this down, and I, and I want to I bring out those, those few points. Number one, he just said that he wasn't going to be brought under the power, allow anything to have control over him, whether it was meat, anything temporal or physical, or whether it was sin in his life. And like he's saying here, fornication. Paul was declaring, listen, I'm not going to be brought under the power of anything, be it something physical or be it something spiritual. Because my body is the Lord's, he says. But the second thing is this. There were those that were eager in that church and at that point in time, which are still in, in our day and time, eager to observe abstaining from certain foods or abstaining from a certain type of uh, a, a thing or, or activity, yet allowing sins like fornication, which is sexual immorality, in their lives and for it to go unchecked. And remember, if you were, if you were here, we covered in, in, in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, that was, that's what was going on in, in this Corinthian church. They had allowed this, this member of the church to continue on without him ever repenting, having sorrow over the sin in, in, in his life. And this man was continuing on in the fellowship. And so that's what Paul's saying. Hey, listen, this is not the case. This should not go unchecked. This should not be allowed in our lives. But the third thing is this, to have regard for and to be controlled by any substance, anything that will one day perish for an organ, our stomach, that's one, one day going to perish away. 
and still not have regard for our body being the Lord's is a grave mistake. And that's what Paul's trying to say. Listen, don't get wrapped up in the temporal. Don't get wrapped up with, with concern about what you're eating or what, what you're not eating and, and, and miss the whole point of, of, of realizing that your body is for the Lord's. And he's going to go further and explain this point. But I would like for you to note this. You can write it down or, or just remember this if you have a, a sharp memory. But many people have more regard for the physical in regards to the physical than they do having the physical in regards to the spiritual. Now, think about that for a second. Many people have more concern and regard for the physical realm in regards to the physical than they do the physical in regards to the spiritual. And whether they're consumed with foods and the, the, is considered gluttony or whatever, or consumed with maybe the other side, diet and exercise. They're, they're consumed with the physical for the physical reasons only. But to be consumed either way and miss the point that our bodies are the Lord's, again, is a grave mistake. And that's what Paul is, is, is bringing out. But it brings to mind, to me, a couple of scriptures. And while I believe that we should take care of our bodies in the physical realm as believers, because this is what God's given us. We get one shot, one body, this is it. I agree wholeheartedly. Our bodies are not to be our, our focus, our aim, just for physical purposes. Taking care of our physical bodies for physical purposes only. Paul said this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. He says this, For bodily exercise profiteth little. It profits, but it's just a little bit. But godliness is profitable unto all things. Not just pertaining to the physical, but all things. Having promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. So again, it's good but it's not to be our main goal. Again, many people are consumed with either food, they, it's, 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 it's sin, and they, they, gluttony, they, they covet it, they, they have to eat it and they consume it. Maybe you struggle with that this morning, in here this morning. Maybe that's you, but maybe it's not. Maybe you're on the flip side and you say, you know what, my struggle is I'm consumed with exercise, I'm consumed with diet, it's, it's, it consumes everything about me. Listen, to just be concerned about those things for physical purposes only is to, to miss greatly what God, God's purpose is for our bodies. And that's what Paul's saying. We are to care for these bodies, but in light of the fact that they're not ours, that they're the Lord's. And again, he'll get to that in just a second. It's not to be our main goal. So we should, at this one, I believe, recall something that, that Paul's saying uh, in Romans. We're doing a study in Romans on Wednesday nights. And he said this, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. So we have to realize that under this, this, this standard of grace in our lives, we're not to let anything have power or exercise authority in our lives other than the grace of God, the Holy Spirit of God, the, 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 the Lord himself. And we often get, get off track with that, but I think what, what's happening right here is Paul trying to get them to get a proper perspective. It's concerning the body of Christ, and we'll see that in just a second, but he's trying to get them to realize that as their individual bodies are important, but it's not just for their individual, bo individual bodies, it's for the body of Christ as a whole, a collective body. Again, remember, it's that body, both individually and collectively, that's to be for the Lord. The body of Christ. Look now in verse 14, he says this, And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise us up by his own power. What an amazing promise, but it adds clarity to this point. Listen, he came, he died, he rose again. And this is the awesome promise. We too will join with that one day with the same exact resurrection power, with the same exact power that God raised up, God the Son, from that grave, you and I will experience that one day. And so this is being reserved. This is the avenue we're going. This is the course that he's paved before us. And, and again, we have to realize what this means is that we are joined with him. We are joined with a holy God, and we're not worthy of that. But that's, that's what shows that we're under grace. But we are joined with him individually and collectively. So we need to regard our body individually, primarily as it pertains to the spiritual. I said, what are you talking about? Again, realizing that we, each individual person in here, has a, a responsibility to care for our bodies as it pertains to the spiritual realm, the spiritual calling, the spiritual purposes of us having this body in the first place. We go back in, into the Garden of Eden, and that gives us a perfect picture of what God's perfect uh, intent was for us having these bodies, to have that fellowship, relationship with him. 
It was a spiritual purpose. Did it have physical implications and physical elements? Absolutely. But the purpose was to be for his pleasure, his fellowship. It was a spiritual purpose. But not only as, a, our, as it pertains to us individually, but again, the collective purpose, as a member of the collective body of Christ, as it pertains to the spiritual. And so with that in mind, I want to offer a question up. Regarding our bodies, caring for our bodies individually, as it pertains to the spiritual, concerning the collective. Think about this. As, answer this question. Am I, are we, doing everything that we can do to ensure not only our individual spiritual health, but the spiritual health of the entire body of Christ. So I think that's where Paul was trying to get these believers to realize, listen, they were setting certain sins aside, they were, they were allowing for certain things in their life, but yet they were being so focused on some things that were so temporal and so, so physical, and it was, it was, they were missing the point, he was trying to get them, listen, your bodies are so valuable, you're joined with the Lord. Don't allow for something in your life that would detract from not only the, your individual relationship, but the collective relationship with the Lord as the body of Christ. And so we have to answer, am I doing my part individually to help ensure the physical or the spiritual health of the collective body? What about here at Trinity Baptist Temple? Are you doing everything to help ensure the spiritual health of the collective body, of this local body at Trinity Baptist Temple. So I want to point this out. Many people in here might say, absolutely, I am. I, I'm, I'm reading my Bible every day. I'm, I'm praying earnestly to God. I, I'm worshiping Him. I'm having this time with Him every day. I, I'm trying to pray throughout the day. I'm witnessing. I'm doing all the things that I, I, I'm trying to do, everything. But I would submit that this is the truth in many ca cases, that many people seem to seek that. They try to do that even at the expense of not ensuring their own individual spiritual health. They're, 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 they're thinking they're, they're playing a part. They're thinking they're helping the church's uh, spiritual health by a certain way, but they're not ensuring their own spiritual health. And, and here's the case. Many people serve the body collectively. They have a responsibility in the church. They have a ministry in the church, and they serve in that ministry, and yet they're not healthy in their individual spiritual lives. They show up and they work in that ministry. They show up and they help and they volunteer. But sometimes they'll allow almost anything to keep them from the church, keep them from being faithful to church. They'll allow almost anything to keep them from being faithful in personal prayer and personal Bible study. They'll, keep, they'll allow anything to keep them with a, from a healthy individual daily walk with God and yet still serve the local church in effort to have a healthy spiritual body. Not possible. Not possible. And that's what Paul's trying to get. Many say, well, well, I'm just trying to help the church. I'm trying to play my part. But again, I would, I would suggest at this point that if that's the, the approach is to just serve in a ministry or have a part in the church or, or volunteer in this area or to do this or to do that or even have a staff position in the church, to do that and not have a proper individual spiritual walk, a healthy spiritual walk with the Lord where nothing would keep you from that, nothing would keep you from church. To have that, to have the wrong mindset of saying, you know, I think I can serve in that without having those things is like maybe trying to put a Band-Aid on a broken limb. And saying, I think that'll, I think that'll do it. I'll, I'll cover up some of the damage. I'll cover up some of the, 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 the true root of the problem with just something exterior. And that's not possible because we know that a Band-Aid doesn't do anything to fix a broken bone. But I think that's what our attempt is sometimes in our spiritual lives. We're, we're going to do something. We're going to put something. We're going to try to do this and, and fix this, and, or this is, our, this is the issue at hand, we're going to try to fix it like, with this, and, and it's just impossible to do that. But we toil, and we still go about that point. So here's the, here's the case. This is what we need to get, I believe. And here's a tough question that we have to answer ourselves. Are we regarding our lives as pertaining to the spiritual, the eternal? Are we regarding our lives enough to qualify that statement? What statement? The body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Am I, is, is my individual life, am, am, am I regarding my, this body, this, this time that God's given me, 
as it pertains to the spiritual, to the eternal. Enough to qualify what Paul just said, that the body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And that's a tough question for us to answer. Is it that or is it that we are brought under the power of something else in our own will, with our own desires, of maybe our own idolatry, our own sin, whatever it may be. But Paul lovingly goes on, lovingly, lovingly but very boldly goes on and asks them to consider their mindset towards their bodies. He's asking them this question as a member of the body of Christ as a whole. Look in verse 15. He says this, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. They make up the member of the body of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? In our minds, the first answer that we have is absolutely not. And that's what Paul answers. God forbid. No way. And then he asks this, what? Don't you know this? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? And what? I thought that was for married people. He says, listen, for, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. That's what God had ordained in marriage. Verse 17, but he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. It's clear once again that this church was misunderstanding. They were, they were missing the, the, the point of how important marriage was, of how important their relationship with one another was and their relationship with God was as a whole. How important proper relationships were. How damaging sins, especially sexual sins, and we're going to see that in just a second. And not only in their own individual lives was it damaging, but also in the collective body. They weren't understanding how important each individual was to the health of the whole. And that's what, we're, that's what we were talking about a while ago. But he pointed out that your individual body are the members that make up the collective body. Your, your individual lives make that up. This is what's going to make it work. But unfortunately, just as it was for them, it's easy for us to forget that even today. That my life, as a redeemed child of God, plays a crucial point, a crucial part in the function of the whole body of Christ. But we live our lives. We go about our days. We just live our lives in freedom, often doing as we please, without any consideration of this body right here. We, don't, we go about our lives and, and, and not ever considering how it might affect even the body of Christ as a whole. Because we live in America and we live our lives and we're, we're, we're used to it. This is how we live. This is the way it goes. We're just kind of used to doing our own thing. Whenever we get the money, we do this. Whenever we have the opportunity, we do this. This is just how it is. But Paul's trying to remind them, trying to bring to, to light their mind, listen, you don't live your lives like that. You're joined with the Lord. And you're part of an entire body. And you play a crucial part. Because if we miss this, if we don't realize that our individual lives play a crucial role in the health of the body of Christ, then what we're doing is we're causing, I believe, a spiritual dam in the local body, in the universal body of Christ. What we're doing in, in, in our, what we consider our freedoms and living our lives and making our choices, we are, we are providing Satan an opportunity to, to stay the hand of God. The work that he wants to do, we were talking about it again this morning in, in a new members class, and, and I shared it, you guys know. Listen, America, I believe, is where we're at today because of Christians not being the Christians that we've called to be. Called to be. God said, you're salt and you're light. You've got to make a difference. You've got to shine your light. You've got to make a difference. But what Christians have done is in our comfort, just gone to our Sunday services, gone to our Wednesday services, sang the songs, were, were encouraged and, and blessed and maybe convicted by the sermon, but then gone out and lived our lives just as it pertains to the physical. Whatever we want, thinking of our physical lives as it pertains, not as the spiritual, and realizing, man, this is the opportunity that I have to make a difference in this world because it's going bad. But we just go silent. We, go, we, we, we get concerned about our own lives. And I share with them, listen, every Thursday night we come out and we go, we go out and knock on doors. And somebody says, I'm just not comfortable with that. But that, that that's, the flesh is not comfortable with doing something spiritual. We've got to get beyond ourselves and say, listen, I, I have been called to be salt and light. I've got to make a difference while I have opportunity to make a difference. Thinking about the physical as it pertains to the spiritual, not just the physical. We've got to get beyond ourselves. We've got to get over ourselves. We've got to get concerned about eternity. We've got to get concerned about things that God cares about. 
And these, these Corinthian believers, they were missing it too. And that's why Paul's saying, listen, you're, you're allowing for things in your life. You're concerned about things that don't matter. Hey, the meat's going to perish. The belly's going to perish. But what about these sins? What about these things that are in your life? What about the spiritual realm? You're missing it. And I'll say this. Maybe it's not a sin of commission like fornication like he's talking about. Maybe it is one of those things of omission. Not being faithful. Not daily walking with God. Not... not whether it's church attendance, giving, uh, outreach, whatever the case may be. But Paul's trying to make the connection in their minds. He's trying to get them to understand that while they have that freedom, hey, you can, you can come to church or not. You can, you can go witness or not. You can, you can give or not. You can, you can do those things or not. You have that. But make the connection in your mind that while it doesn't seem like it affects anything beyond yourself, it does. While we don't think, well, no, it's not going to matter if I miss this one service, it does. Well, well you know, there's, there's, there's 20, 30 people going out knocking doors. It doesn't matter if I, if I do that at my workplace or, or, or go and be a part of that. It does. Because how many people to our one, for us not being the salt and light, how many people to us, our one, are just living a life of sin openly, trying to propagate the, the, the sin message? I can tell you it's a lot. Their, their voice is loud. They're screaming loud. So much so that in a Christian a nation founded on Christian, Christian principles, that the highest court in our land would even be considering something that's against the very nature of what God created. Amen. Marriage, the way that God ordained it. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of fight in Satan. He knows the end of the book, yet he's still fighting. So we as Christians got to realize, listen, I've got to consider my life, this breath that I'm breathing, this body that I'm living in, I've got to regard it as it pertains to the spiritual, the eternal. Not just the physical, not just what pleases me, not just what makes me happy, but what pleases God because the body's for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Paul's trying to make this connection with them. He's trying to get them, and he, and he takes it to this, this marriage union, this relationship. When you join yourselves to a harlot, he says, you've made a union that's only ordained within marriage. And it's not just a physical union because God himself ordained it. So therefore, it's a spiritual union. And if it's a spiritual union, then you've made the entire body of Christ be a part of that. And again, they were disregarding the spiritual. They were disregarding the importance of their lives as it pertained to the spiritual. And Paul was trying to say, when you bring sin in, into the equation of this nature, sexual, then something it's going to happen. Something is, is, is going to be stayed. Some, some, some damage is going to be done. The whole entire body of Christ has been made subject to this. I said, man, so what's the solution? What's the fix? What's the, what's the help? Paul tells them, verse 18, flee fornication. Flee it. And I believe that, that we could put other things in there, but he was trying to, again, make this connection in their life, how important it was that their bodies were for the Lord's, that 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 and how that relates to their relationships with, the, with one another, how they were to regard their lives as part of the body of Christ. Again, they had allowed things in the church. They had allowed things in their individual lives, and it had caused damage. So he says, flee it. And he says, every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. So to join what is God's to a harlot, he says, is a contradic contradiction of the truth of the entire body, the entire purpose wrought within itself. How? How is it? Well, what contradiction? Again, the body is for the Lord's. Again, we can call it whatever, but again, he's making this point very clear. There's a right way to view your life. There's a right way to view your body. And the way to view it is like this. It's the Lord's. You are the Lord's. Remember that, he says. And to flee from this sin, to flee from fornication means to cut off all possible avenues that would lead to, as well as, aid to. Run as, as if you would run from danger. Don't play with fire because you'll get burned. Someone might say, well, why is this important to cover in, in this letter? Why, was he, why did he take this moment and, and talk about this right here? And I'll say it once again. This church had a problem with being concerned about certain things and puffing themselves up about certain things. Having conviction in certain areas 
Well, we got great speakers. We got great this. We've got wonderful gifts there. Paul even acknowledged, yeah, you're, you got great gifts. You're doing great things. They were concerned with, with who they were a part of. I'm of Paul. I'm, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Cephas. I'm of that. They were concerned about certain things as pertaining to the physical. And yet, as in chapter 5, we saw they were allowing for things that was damaging the whole body. But the truth is we see that even today. Christians not concerned about the entire body. We get so focused on ourselves. We get so focused on what we want, what, what pleases us. We can, we're concerned with the physical as it pertains to the physical. And we don't consider, hey, am I dragging down the entire body at Trinity Baptist Temple? Am I dragging down the entire body of the universal church of God because I am a member of it. And if I'm not regarding this vessel as it pertains to my relationship with God on a daily basis, then I am part of that dam that's hindering God's working in and through the life of his, of his body. And I, that convicts me, that, makes, that, that flies all over me because you know what, I don't want to do anything to hinder what God's purposes are. But I know on a daily basis, we, we, all, we all fall short. We miss the mark. But that right there should cause us to strive and try even more. So what's the answer? If, 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 what about the people that were guilty of that? What, what about those people? I believe it would be very clear. Just as he commanded them with that, that one in, in chapter 5. That person needs to repent. Hey, if repentance, then as Paul said, hey, don't look back, move forward. Go, go forward, serve Christ with everything that you have. But they were wallowing in it. They weren't repenting of it. They weren't, they weren't contrite over their sin. They, weren't, they, they were, hey, just allowing for it in their lives. And I believe they were missing that correlation between marriage and their relationship with the Lord. Paul covers that in Ephesians chapter 5, the roles in marriage and how it relates to the, the relationship with the Lord. And again, we're living in a day right now that marriage and relationships, proper relationships are under attack. Make, it it makes, us, makes us Christians sick to know that in America that th there's an agenda that's being propagated again to even the highest court we were talking about this uh, yesterday I think it was me and, and brother Rodney I can't remember but um, it's just heartbreaking to know that this is what we're dealing with in America that we as Christians this is what it is and here's the case they think that because we wholeheartedly disagree with, with homosexuality, that it's a sin, that that, that is hate. And, he, and some of you have even read the, the emails going around, even from military, saying that these groups are considered uh, uh, hate groups or, or uh, uh, terrorist groups or even, I mean, trying to categorize us who have opinions and convictions based on the Word of God towards sin, that we are intolerant, that we are sinners, I mean, uh, hate, hate groups. And we were saying this, that is absolutely the opposite. Because we love them and we hate the sin. We, we don't want them to be under control of that sin and want them to see that it is sin. That's love. That, that, takes, that takes care and concern to, to want somebody to not go to, to, to a destination that Christ has provided a way for them not to go. For somebody to live a life of sin that's gonna take them to an eternal lake of fire and to have the care enough to say, hey, stop. That's sin. Stop. Don't go that way anymore. Turn to Jesus Christ. He's made a way. That takes care and concern. That takes love. That's not hate. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't groups out there, and, and you know some of them, they're crazies, that do hate, and they have a hateful message. But that's not us. We, we want to share the love of God. We want to show people that it is wrong. But that's not just the only epidemic. There's all kinds of epidemics with relationships in our world today. Improper relationships. So we as Christians must strive to regard our bodies as members of God's body. We've got to see ourselves as part of this. And Paul closes this chapter before he, he covers uh, anything else. He's going he's to close this up with a reminder in the form of another question. And it's a, maybe you, you know this scripture real well, but look in verse 19. He says this, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God. It's from God, he says. And you're not your own. 
How am I not my own? For you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God. See, here's the deal. As I said a while ago, we can't be so concerned about certain things that we think are important and think that we're contributing to the overall health of the body of Christ. Well, it's not that big of a deal if I don't do this. It's not a big of a deal if I don't do that. Well, as long as I'm doing this, I think I'm okay. No, we are not our own, he says. We are bought with a a, a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesdays or when the church meets. He says, listen, your bodies are, the, are the, 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 the physical body of Christ right now on this earth. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies. Be the salt. Be the light. Be faithful as he's been faithful to you. Love as he's loved you. Give as he's given unto you. Pour your lives out before him because you've been bought with a price that you could never repay. And I think this should serve as a reminder for us of that thing right there. Our bodies are the dwelling place. If we're born again, if we're Christians, if we've, if we've repented of our sins, we've turned our lives over to Jesus Christ. He, he died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. And that we believe he's the only way. He's the truth. He's the life. We have all of our confidence, so much so that we've surrendered to him. That's what trust is. That's what faith is. If we are in that state right there, then we are the dwelling place of the most high God. That's amazing. That's an amazing concept. That God would would take dirty vessels, sinful vessels, and when they place their faith in Him, wash them, white as snow, and then live in them. What an honor. What a what a privilege. What a responsibility. And we've got to realize, man, I've got to, I've got to glorify God in this body. I've got to think about this body as it pertains to the spiritual, not just as it pertains to the physical. Not just according to what I think is important, but what God thinks is important. Not living my life according to what I think a Christian should live, but what God says a Christian li- how, how he, a Christian lives. And that's where Paul was trying to take them to. You've been joined with God Almighty in a spiritual union, and that spiritual union is also encompassing the physical. And so your physical lives are spiritual in nature. And so we've got to remember to honor him. We've got to remember to live for him. Why? Because again, we're not our own. And that's how Paul was able to say, I'm not going to be brought under the power of any because I'm not my own. I see my life constantly, every day. I'm, I, I'm, I'm reminded that I, I'm not my own. I've experienced the grace of God. I'm the chiefest of sinners, he said. I, if any man deserves death, I deserve it. But I'm constantly reminded that I'm not my own. He shed his precious, his his. His, his, his pure blood, the only blood that was worthy to cover the sins of the world, and it covered mine. And so I realize I'm not my own anymore, and that's what Paul was trying to get them to, to, to realize. Listen, quit trying to do church your way. Quit trying to live your life your way. Quit trying to define it on your terms and turn to the one who redeemed you and get his definition and his direction and live according to his standards. And I believe that's why it caused Paul to strive to live that way. It caused him to, to be obedient in, in areas that he otherwise wouldn't have been obedient. And this morning, I believe there's lessons that we can learn as the musicians come. First of all, I think the lesson that we can, can ask ourselves is, are we caring for our individual lives like we should? I want to say this. Yes, physically. Are you taking care of your body physically? As it pertains to the physical, because this is the one shot we get. but more importantly, spiritually. Are we regarding our bodies physically as it pertains to the spiritual? Realizing that we're just but a part of the entire body. And even if we feel like we're an insufficient part, we're a part of the body. And it's important for us to do and be what he has called us to do and be. But secondly, are we doing everything that we can do to ensure proper relations in the church, outside of the church. I said this this morning too, a lot of times people, they don't, and this may ruffle some feathers, but I'm sorry, this is just the truth. There's a lot of people, maybe in this room, that gripe about our our elected officials. And as a citizen, as, as as a citizen of the United States, let's just say that you're right. But I believe that you don't have as much of a right is those who vote 
and say, this is what I'm standing for. And then I would flip it over and say it like this. If we're going to gripe about the moral condition of America and yet sit idly by and not do anything, I don't know. We may have a right as a child of God to say this is wrong and this is right. Absolutely. But how much of a right do we have to gripe and complain about the direction of our country and the moral condition if we're not willing to stand up and be the salt and light? To live our lives, to speak the word of God, to witness, to knock on the doors. Listen, we've been placed in this area and we can have an impact in this area if we make an impact in this area. And it's not just going to happen by having this building here and putting, putting signs out there and, and, and having music playing from the doors as they open or anything like that. It's going to happen by Christian realizing, hey, if we're going to affect anything, it's going to happen because we're going out and affecting it outside of us. Yes, in your jobs. Yes, in your families. Yes, in your neighborhoods. But in our community, as far as we can reach, being salt and light, making a difference. Because this is the only life we have. This is the only moment that we have, the only opportunity we have. And the third thing is this, are we realizing that while we have the freedom to live our lives as we choose, we are indeed not our own if we're in Christ? Are we, are, are we really getting that? Because if we are, I think that we'll be putting him first, regarding him first, even above our own desires, even bo- above what we think is right, above this world's direction. We glorify him in our bodies. If you'll stand with us this morning, I want to pray. And I would ask us to, to really consider that because I promise you I've been challenged with this. Am I glorifying the Lord in my body? Am I giving God everything as a member of the body of Christ? Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your word. God, you challenged the Corinthian believers because they were obviously not realizing how important their individual lives were as it pertains to your eternal kingdom, as it pertained to the entire body of Christ as a whole. And God, I think that we get, we're guilty of that even today. We think about our own lives as it pertains to our life and not as it pertains to what your will is, not as it pertains to the entire body of Christ. And Lord, I pray that you help us today to remember that question that you asked in verses 19 and 20. Lord, that don't we realize that we're not our own? that we've been bought with a price. And so we need to glorify you in these bodies. Help us this morning. And God, again, I pray if there's someone here that's not surrendered their life to you, if they're not born again, I pray this morning they would come and they would say, I want that free gift. I don't want to go to hell. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to experience life. And I want heaven to be my home. I pray that you would just move this morning. We'll praise you for it all. We ask and pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll come. as they sing. God, make us yours. Help us glorify your name in our lives.
Well, praise God. You guys can be seated for just a moment. <clears throat> I just want to thank you guys for being here, and I pray that you're challenged this morning. I know this message is a challenge to me. I just don't want to get right before the, the throne of God and wish, man, I could have tried a little bit harder. And I know right now I could say that I could try harder, and I'm not okay with that. So I want to uh, I want to give God more, and so I pray that you're challenged to give him more and, um, and see ourselves as he sees us. So um, I want to say it was good to have Brother Glenn here. Good to see you here, and um, blessing to have you here. Praise God. also want to extend, um, again, our, our condolences and our love to uh, Miss Angela and, and Brother Marty and y'all's whole families. Uh, for Brother Jerry, and I know that he's not suffering anymore, and Praise God for that, you know, and, um, but uh, we're going to be praying for you, and we're here for y'all, and um, again, I'm going to continue to extend it to the Hastings family, and also to uh, Brother Sal, and I got, had some people losing loved ones here recently, and that's tough, so let's remember to keep those families in our prayer, and, and um, we got troopers just marching along, and I see Miss Debbie sitting over here, and Brother Eugene back there, and um, I got to only be short with this, because this, is that's, uh, tough stuff right there, and so um, let's keep these families in our prayer. They're going through um, just great trials, you know, and uh, but praise God he's on the throne. He's in control, so um, again, if you're a, a visitor and, and you got one of these cards, you didn't get an opportunity to get it in the offering plate, I, I, you can get one of these guys in the green jacket. We just want to have a record of your visit, and if there's any way we can minister to you. Uh, help you in any way so please please get that to them and, and we'd love to to be able to do anything we can do to help you so if you had a birthday or anniversary this last week if you'll come forward we want to sing to you birthday or anniversary come on down <clears throat> go we still have some anybody else all right all birthdays let's sing happy birthday God bless you. Thank you again for being here. Brother Mike, if you'll come dismiss us. And I hope you have a blessed afternoon. Love you guys. Well, God bless you guys for being here this morning. I'd just like to add that if you're a brand new visitor, if you've never visited with us before, if this is your first time, uh, we would like to meet you. And we have a, a family, a, a couple that are going to be outside in the foyer at that little receiving desk the crouches. Uh, so we would like for you to just go to that little receiving desk and let them meet you and uh, us know that you came and visited with us. And if you have any questions, they'll be able to help you. God bless you guys. Thank you all for being in your place. Don't forget to be back tonight at 530. We will be having baptism. So God bless you. Have a good day. Get something good to eat and be safe. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer. We just thank you, Lord, for bringing us into your house this morning. We pray, Father, you watch over and bless us and bless our households. And bring us back safe at the, at the appointed time. We thank you, Father, for the great message that you have given us. Help us to use it and apply it to our lives. We love you, Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.